Welcome. We are so happy to have you with us for this very, very special program. The title is Hilma Af Klint, The Mystical Life of a Revolutionary Artist. And we have with us the director, writer, and producer of the documentary Beyond the Visible, Helena Dirska. It is so wonderful to have an opportunity to talk with Helena and to share with you more information about Hilma and her spiritual journey. So welcome, Helena. Such a joy to see you. And uh, your documentary is just so wonderful. Our plan today is to talk about the spiritual aspects of Hilma of Clint's life and work. H.P. Blavatsky, co-founder of the Theosophical Society, defined spirituality as not about virtue and goodness, but rather she said that spirituality is the power of receiving formless spiritual essences. To me, this describes Hilma's work beautifully. Could you talk a little bit um, to us all about Hilma's spiritual journey? Okay, hello to everybody. And thank you very much for the inv invitation, Barbara. I'm also very happy to talk to you. And yeah, I'm, I'm still quite um, overwhelmed that uh, the film, but especially Hilma Afrin's whole work is bringing so much joy to the people. I think this is really important. And I think the reason why it works so well is because it is a true, there's a true meaning beyond those, yeah, images, let's say, beyond those images. And everybody can feel that when you're standing in front of it. And I have, I have been to so many exhibitions during my filming of the film. So I've traveled to some countries and in the museums, but I always saw the same, yeah, slightly the same situation. People standing there being really, truly, truly taken by uh, by this energy that's coming out and people who are deeply touched. And I think it's really heart opening. And I ask myself, okay, why is this working so very well? For example, in comparison with something like Mondrian or Kandinsky, because I had always the feeling, I think they wanted the same thing, but in my point of view, they didn't succeed as Hilma of Klint. And the reason I would say is because Hilma of Klint was so very well connected. <laughs> See, well, she was simply very well connected to what she is showing. Um, and that is something, of course, very spiritual. Although I would not call her a spiritual artist because this was used to, um, to, to make a, her... Um, a less, a less good artist. That was used as an argument to make her uh, just a spiritual artist. So, and I, so, so um, I would say she is an artist, but she's somehow translating something which she saw or which was showing, show, which, which, yeah, let's say those um, souls showed her. So that's probably, I'm sorry, something was, that was my, the door was okay. I started. I started over again. The sentence. So, so that is simply why it works so very well because the spiritual journey uh, of her worked so very well, and the spiritual journey started quite early in her life. Um, I would say, um, as far as we know, um, it might have started when she was seventeen, eighteen. Hilma Flynn's sister Hermina. Um, was 10 years younger than Hilma of Klint, but they were quite close and she died. We don't know exactly why, but she was obviously ill and died very early. And after that, quite or in this time period, Hilma of Klint started to do seances. And what is really interesting I found is that her father supported that. It was not something today, many people today think, 
oh, this is something that is a contradiction. She was coming from this naval, naval officer's family, <laughs> or uh, more in the naturalistic, thinking probably in a naturalistic way. But the father was um, also an astronomist. I mean, he, he, he knew a lot about this. And he obviously taught also his daughters in astronomy. So Hilma of Klint, was already looking as a child probably at yeah at the universe in a different way and um and then around 90 so in, at the end of the 19th century the seances began or came, became very yeah very fancy in a way but also and and the theosophical society started then uh, in um uh, in sweden also and hilma klin so first she went to some seances um, that was already, we think, in 1870, in, somehow in the 1870s. And then she became a member of the Theosophical Society. And obviously her father had also some connections to people who did seances. And it was not a big problem that obviously his daughter went there. And maybe, I don't know, probably not the whole family, but obviously this was not such a big problem. So she got involved in some of those spiritual groups. And one of the first groups was the Edelweiss Verbundet. That was um, a group, I think mainly, no, not, not just women, but uh, mainly women. And um, there she was for some years, but, um, uh, and then she became a member of the Theosophical Society, which um, I don't know much about how many meetings they had, but I think, um, I have the feeling that Hilma Afklund was quite busy at this time. <laughs> she was in, in, the, in this Edelweiss group, she was at the Theosophical Society, and then she founded her own group, which were, were the Friday group and also called De Femme, the Five, the group of the five. And obviously I had the feeling that in the Edelweiss group, they were not too happy and they wanted to do something for themselves. And that's where Hilma Afklund get, got involved and they really tried to connect with this, yeah, with this different plane, the different realm, I don't know, whatever it was, <laughs> the fourth dimension. Yeah, but it worked. It took a while. This is something probably we have, aha, probably I should say, we're talking about more or less 10 years where this group, the, the five worked, and then Hilma of Klin started, so it's 1896. Um, when they started it, I think the, the notebooks start there. And then uh, um, she started in 1906, her first abstract series. It sounds like she was so involved um, with things that related to higher consciousness mm -hmm. from her late teen years forward, mm -hmm. first with the Edelweiss Society I know that she joined the Theosophical Society in Sweden at its inception in 1889. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a, a literal member for over 25 years and I think heavily involved throughout most of that time. It's my understanding that she had a copy of The Secret Doctrine written by Helena Blavatsky. Yeah. I mean, in my film, you see it quite shortly, probably. I have filmed it. It's called Hemliga Leran. So it's uh, this, uh, um, it's a very nice, I mean, in leather, leather, uh, leather books. And you can see they're extremely old because they're quite delicate. And when I was the first time I was in the archive, um, I opened those books and you can see, and some of this is also in the film. So maybe some of you, if you have another look at the film or again, then you see she has um, underlined some words and I filmed some of that, that not, I, I have um, chosen for the film, the words that are like abstraction because like, um, Kubus, so something like abstract forms she has underlined, which is very funny, but she had made a lot of notes in the, in the secret doctrine. And uh, so, and if you see at Hilma Afklund's notebooks, she really have studied it, I would say. As she, and it is, I for myself think it's, this is work to read the secret doctrine, it's really work. Um, but of course, um, I for myself, sometimes if you just open it, uh, then you can, 
also find something interesting. But I, I have really, I would say Hilma Flint read it from the beginning to the end. And she really tried to deeply understand it. That's how she also worked all of her life. I mean, she really become dedicated. And what I found so, yeah, so very special about her life is that she really, she never left this path again. It really became her main focus, which I would say is probably a very meaningful focus. <laughs> she really, truly walked the spiritual path. She was a true seeker her whole life, it sounds like, and um, which is what the documentary shows. And um, I think the other research that has gone into Hilma's life and how beautiful to have this in front of us. Do you have anything that you can show us that may indicate her work with Blavatsky's work or the secret doctrine or? Yeah, probably can show um, this. Um, I have a little um, excerpt of the of one of the notebooks that we can show. Okay, yeah, here it is. Um, this is a notebook because um, Hilma of Clint, I think it's, it's important to say that Hilma of Clint really uh, was a theosophist probably all of her life. You can see that it's in a painting for a theosophist, it's not very uh, uh, difficult to recognize. But here, this is a notebook, it's a small notebook from 1935 where Hilma of Clint was already in her 60s, yeah, so in her late 60s. And here she's talking, I have marked that, uh, about Helena Blavatsky. She's talking about something that she revealed and uh, which was coming out and that this is getting more and more important. And I think this is very interesting because you can see that obviously after she has probably done, um, yeah, most of her work, let's say as an artist, she is still trying to find out things and still digging and seeking for something that you have to, to, to look for the whole of your life, right? So that's how it is. It's a lifetime's work. And, uh, and so that's why I'm, I just um, made this uh, little excerpt here just to see that even in the late thirties, she talked about her. And um, if we see the next, um, photograph probably that um, here's a photograph from uh, that I made in the Theosophical Society in Stockholm when we were there. It's one of the books, um, um, the, it's, it's a year's journal probably. I think it's from, yeah, it was from 1998, one of the, or 1996 something, uh, a year's journal. And here you see there was, um, there is a page where you have those abstract signs. I think they're from Annie Besant and Lee Bitter somehow. Um, but I think this is very interesting because when you look at that, it's not so hard to find the connection to Hilma's paintings. Um, and I think she, she must have looked at it. And there's the next painting. I have a little detail. Um, yeah. And here you also see the spiral, which is a highly, um, uh, yeah, highly used, very often used in Hilma of Klin's paintings. And, um, and the, next, the next photograph you could see, for example, here is, um, this is just from one of her notebooks. And here you can see that she's also working like that. She's, she's making, she's not just writing. In every notebook you find little details. She's trying to, she's, she's doing some sketches and some symbols she's inviting them. And uh, here it's about one of her main topics, the man and the, so man and kvinna is uh, as woman. And uh, so, and she's the pyramid, you know, <laughs> all those kind of things. Right here, you can see the spiral that she's using, always with writing, always with questions. A lot of them are connecting. Um, a lot of notebooks are collecting. She's trying to explain her, her paintings. Here, she's also talking about Ananda and Amaliel. Those were the spiritual leaders she was connecting with. And, um, and here, they're, 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 obviously, they're trying to talk about the, the, the future. Um, but this is, um, yeah, this is just a little example about uh, that I think she was very well aware of everything that was going on, even in this theosophical uh, society and yeah, and probably in the whole 
spiritual uh, society, let's say. And and here she's trying to find her own way through through, um, yeah, through this life. So amazing, and to see her work um, like this. Um, it's just is just incredible. She in in her paintings and obviously in these journals that she kept, um, she uses a tremendous number of symbols. Um, mm -hmm. And as you showed in the book, um, the picture that you took of the book, which I believe probably was occult chemistry, written mm -hmm. by Annie Besant and mm -hmm. uh, C. W. Leadbeater. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many similarities. Could you talk a little bit about some of the symbolic meanings in in her work, um, the spiritual symbolic meanings? Mm -hmm. Well, hmm, I yeah, I don't know if I can go to detail because um, probably I put it this way: the um, she had, as far as we know, she had all, the, let's say, the main important books, as far as we know. There's not much, not everything is still there in the in the um, foundation uh, because some of it, yeah, she probably she, she gave away and probably she didn't possess all the books, but she had Annie Besant books, uh, the, her writings, The Secret Doctrine and so on. And um, I mean, she really read a lot, so she must have had a lot of books. Um, so she was influenced by those, um, let's say, symbols and the theories and the writings of others. But she was very well aware also about other people who, was, who were working about the same kind of things. For example, there is in Denmark, which is not so far from Sweden at this time, was a spiritual leader called Martinus. I don't know if you know him, Martinus. And he was around 30 years younger than Hilma of Klint. What is funny is that he also um, did some te more technical paintings that resemble in a way very much Hilma of Klint's paintings, which resemble a lot of things in theosophy. But for me, it is, for me, it is like that, that I think everybody was looking at the same thing. And then you see the same thing and you translate it in the same, um, and you, you can, of course you can, can give an explanation of all the symbols and everything. Um, if you see the spiral to deepen your wisdom, you know, your spiritual wisdom, but the wisdom of life. But for me, um, what is even more important is how this whole oeuvre is working. I mean, she worked in series, which is important. It's not just about this symbol or that symbol. She's really, I mean, you have this wonderful series, The Dove, the first one in, in, behind you. And when you go on with The Dove, we will see that later. We have the last Dove. She's really coming. This looks, for example, like, which is also interesting, this um, painting you have behind you is, we have the DNA spiral, for example. It looks like a DNA spiral, which was uh, just discovered 50 years later. So <laughs> almost 50 years later. And um, it goes through the heart, right? It goes through something that looks like a heart. And around this heart is somehow like a cosmos. But this could also be the very, very detailed. This could be like someone looking through a microscope. And in the end of the series, you have the feeling and everybody can look that up because you have probably the catalogs. I mean, we don't have to show all the paintings, but in the end of this series, The Dove, she's showing the universe. Somehow you're going. And this micro macrocosm is, is really working fabulously without even, even if you don't want to think about it theoretically, you just can stand there and you, you immediately understand. For me, it is like that. I, do, I did understand when I first encountered when I came into this the first time through the museum and I stood there surrounded by Hilma Afton's painting, I thought, oh, finally, I thought, finally, I get to see what the truth is. And we know there's no true uh, religion higher than truth. And this is actually what she is really intending to show, even if she was not sure. You have very often in her notebooks that she's writing, oh, I'm not sure what is this meaning and whatever, but, uh, but maybe this is quite natural. While you're doing something, you realize, oh, uh, uh, I don't know <laughs> what am I doing or it's there and what is it? 
but uh, I, I wouldn't say she would ask this question nowadays because when you're going in there, it is completely, for me, it's completely clear. clear, clear. I, don't, I don't have the feeling that I have to ask more questions when I'm in front of that. And that's why this work is so very important because it gives us an image for things we can't talk about actually. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Yes. There are no words to describe that higher consciousness, yeah. to describe the universe and the cosmos. But yeah. she gives us, you know, mm. that old saying of a, one picture is worth a thousand words. Mm. Yeah. There are even the words that we can't, we, we can't even use. Mm. Yeah. Would you, going back to her spiritual journey, would you talk a little bit about the five? Mm -hmm. um, and how and why she got involved and how that led to these amazing mm -hmm. pieces of art. Yeah, well, it seemed to be that she was not so very, or at one point, the Edelweiss Society, where she was a member of, um, went probably into a direction. This was also, um, I mean, the influence was where, coming very strongly from Christian, Christianity in the Edelweiss society. So probably they, and, and Tilma Afrind was also very influenced by that, but probably they wanted to go even further. And probably they had the, the feeling this was not working in this society. And her, one of her best friends, Anna Kassel, was also in this society and obviously three other women, which she met there at the Edelweiss So they, um, yeah, they founded a new group called De Femme, the Five, which is also called sometimes the Friday group and some notebooks you see Friday, the, the Friday books so sessions um, because they always met Fridays. I have the feeling she must have, have been extremely busy. I think uh, probably she was still living at home because she was not married. And uh, so I have the feeling that constantly probably her mother thought, okay, where's Hilma? She's still not here, you know? I mean, she must have been busy at least uh, three, four days, uh, five days a week, meeting, doing uh, painting and all those stuff. I mean, she it's a tremendous work. So she really worked a lot. And um, so, um, and she really kept on going. So the first years with the with the five, they made the seances, which was basically that um, they, I think they were praying. I don't know, probably also singing because of some of the books. You have some pray books where you have some praise, and it looks like they were singing because I think there was also a piano sometimes there. And uh, then somebody lay down and tried to connect or to see someone or to hear a message and another one was taking the notes or they were um ah, how do you call they were also working with this board sometimes this um, a ouija board a yeah. ouija board but it was yeah. a special one right, right. yeah the ouija board, yeah, board. Uh, with this board this is sometimes they they make notes on the on the um automatic drawings they do um and she didn't succeed it in the first place. I think uh, there's uh, one note about that Hilma of Clint was trying to look in a glass of water. And they, the, so the spirit told, you have to look in a glass of water and then you will see. And she's, she, she kept looking, she didn't see anything. <laughs> and so she's looking and nothing happened. But obviously at some point she went further than anyone in this group because in the end she created something and that obviously came right out of her, she saw in front of her, whatever. But that took really a while, as I said, like 10 years. And in this 10 years, they made regularly this seances and started that what was called in the 20s, the Écriture Automatique, right? So this automatic drawing. And um, I have another pay, um, picture of that. Probably we can show this um, slide from the five. Yeah, right. This is from a notebook from, I think, nine. 1903 three or four, which is also what I like. This is something that obviously came out of one of the automatic drawings. And um, yeah, 
you can look for yourself. And uh, I, I really like this one because um, somehow you have this Christian symbols, but it looks also like something that you can find in a universe, something like a, <laughs> a cosmos, some planets. And um, uh, the next photograph, here you can also see, yeah, the five. Here's, this is funny because, um, yeah, Unifersum sense here, as far as I read this, this is in German so because it says Himmel, which means the sky or heaven. In English, you have two meanings, but, <laughs> but it's so it's got or heaven, let's say heaven. And here they're also showing a universe. It looks like really a universe. And the word homo, you can see, universum, so universe, um, sense, the feeling, and the heaven. So, um, this is also from 1904. So they're trying to get there, you know, closer and closer to something. Uh, sometimes this looks very wild, but this is also something that I pretty much like because here you can also see a lot of symbols that you will see then later in Hilma of Quinn's uh, paintings. And you will recognize that. And the next photograph uh, here, this is very obvious. This is from 1905. And here you see this spiral or from the, um, snail, the house <laughs> of the snail. And this is something that uh, some of you might recognize that this, yeah, this kind of sketch or painting we will see then in her first series in 1906. This is a year later or half a year later when she's, she's, she's doing that. She started the, uh, the primordial chaos, the series. And there we see uh, this this isn't then in yellow and blue, but here we see the sketches. So it's really a way. And so obviously everything that they're that they're creating in this process, obviously everything, and then nothing is lost. Obviously, obviously Himmelfin absorbs everything and it stays with her and, and she comes closer and closer to what she is about to do. <laughs> yeah. That is just amazing. Yes, yeah. it's, it's just amazing. Anything else that you wanted to mention about the five or? Um, I, I don't just know. didn't want to cut you off, that's all. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think the, um, yeah, what we might say, I mean, they had the same problems like in every group. Even the Theosophical Society, Blavatsky had also other problems. I, I mean, and this, this is so... Yeah, we're human beings. <laughs> this is so incredible human. It's a lifetime's work, what we have to do. If you want really to achieve, to come close to something that means a good, a truly good life, then it means a lifetime work. And I think Hilma Afton was pretty aware of that. But of course the group, the five had also their problems. I mean, I think obviously there was a kind of, um, um, how do you say, um, um, like a competition between her and Secret. Uh, Secret was one of the one of the women of the five, and um, and obviously she she wanted to I don't know be the leader because Hilma Afflin was not in the first place, but she became then the leader because she because I think she she connected probably very well in the end, and she was the one who really brought the group forward with her art then because it, it transformed in something that was there. That is the interesting thing about her work. It's suddenly we have something here on this planet that really reveals to us how it might be or how it is. And that is the whole, that, that is the thing that um, intrigued me probably the most when I um, encountered Hilma of Klin's painting and I thought I have to make a film about it. Um, and that's why I also involved in the film, the natural sciences to make, to let, to make people see or to let them see even the natural or especially the natural sciences when we come to physics and quantum physics, this is not something that you can divide totally from spirituality. And actually what is not spiritual on this planet? We have just made our life, our everyday life is made as if it is not. And I would say this is wrong. This is because it's not working. We even see that today. We have now a world where everybody is now afraid. 
And actually, I would say this is a natural rule. If somebody uh, says you have to be afraid, then he's never right. This is a natural law. You can't be afraid of what should be afraid of life or of death. And this is something that you can encounter in Hilma of Klint's work very well. Life and death, it's the same actually. Life and death is the same. So if you are afraid, what are you afraid of? That your life is probably not your life. This is a really, I think this would be the only question we should think about <laughs> because if you are living your life, then you are not afraid of death. You can't be because this is something, it's a process. And you just get as far as you get in during your lifetime. And probably in the next life, you hopefully you get on. <laughs> and oh, by the way, Hilma Flint thought she had um, 16 reincarnations left. In some of her notebooks, it's marked that she has 16 reincarnations left. And I thought, oh, that's still so much. But I think in a Buddhistic view, it's not so much anymore, <laughs> not so many anymore. And, um, but I like that so very much because what I really think about it, Hilma of Klin's life, we don't know much about her private life, but when you look at that, how she worked and what she had done, writing, writing a lot, working, then this is really a successful life because she was really trying to find out why am I here? And this is probably the most important question and not thinking about what other people tell you, how you should live and what you should do or what you should think. If we would be more with ourselves, and that's what she's of course saying, you have, you're, you have to look inwards, not, out, <laughs> not outside of you. This is, this is not working. And we see this even nowadays. And I'm, I have to say, I'm very happy that we have now Hilma of Klin's um, uh, yeah, Hilma of Klin's work now. Even before this crisis started, Hilma of Klin's work became famous. I think this is very interesting. The timing is very interesting because obviously, obviously the timing before was not so right, but now it is there. And, and here you can really see um, at work, but also at the life of an, of an human being who was really just going fearlessly onwards, just fearlessly her very own path. This is something that not many people do. Most of the people are distracted by um, things they think they are told to do this and they are told to act like that. And then they do that and finally they find out, oh, but that's not what I want and I'm very unhappy. And that's not easy to discover and not easy to, to tell yourself, okay, but probably I can do it in another way. Where's the problem? And I would say Hilma Afklin succeeded quite well, yeah. Absolutely, I would, I would wholeheartedly agree with you. And again, that follows with the, her whole spiritual journey and her whole connection to the Theosophical Society, which has no dogma, which does not tell people what to do except to listen to themselves and to seek inwardly mm -hmm. for answers to life, um, mm -hmm. to life's questions and the meaning of life and why we're here and what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And it also combines um, science and philosophy and religion and spirituality and the arts. It, it all comes together because there is no, we can't divide it even though it appears to be that way in this illusory world. Yeah, 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 that's true. Could, could you talk a little bit about um, this spiritual nature of, I mean, we've been talking about the spiritual nature of her artwork, but her work with the individuals that she calls the high masters. Mm -hmm. You had briefly touched on it earlier about Ananda and Amalil. Yeah, but if you could, yeah, yeah, she she had. I mean, she obviously had some high masters. Yeah, Ananda Amalian come there very often, and Gregor is the other one. And uh, you also see that in the Écriture Automatique. Some sometimes you can read the name Gregor, so he's coming there obviously uh, quite early. And I don't know when they realize that, but. Um, I mean, I haven't studied the notebooks as far. I have learned some Swedish just that I get along so I could read some of it, but it's not so easy. It's very old fashioned Swedish. 
Um, but um, what is interesting is really how when you see that she's really trying to find answers uh, in a theoretical way to the spiritual work they're doing. And sometimes I have the feeling this is not working. It's better working if they listen to the high masters, but it's not so easy. They don't tell you, I mean, if it would be easy, we wouldn't be here, I think, on this planet. The thing is, the, um, this is, the language is probably, if you translate it to our language, it's probably, this is, it's not so definite. But life is not definite. It's not, that's how you say it. We can't divide. We can say it's like this and like that. And that's how it is. And uh, so also her writings about this whole spiritual context is sometimes sometimes a bit contradictionary but um but obviously they are they she knows that they are connecting with spiritual masters from um i mean ananda was um um a warrior right uh, in in china um, in the I don't, I don't know in the 13th century or something uh, so some somewhere she she writes that there's also a very nice little anecdote from her niece i mean the the wife of her nephew she obviously talked about with her family members she never tried to con convince someone they they told me so this niece said oh she never tried she never talked about that as as she was trying to convince someone to believe it or something so she i think she really have understood how this works so but um Obviously, she told her once about Ananda. And so this niece of Hilma of Clint, the wife of her nephew, she went after Hilma of Clint, long after Hilma of Clint's death, she went to a museum and there was a Buddhistic exhibition, something. <laughs> and she sat down to rest a little bit. And then she watched, I don't know, to her left. And then she saw a little, little statue and it was called Ananda. And she, she thought she'd get a heart attack. <laughs> she said, oh God, Hilma was talking about that all the time and it exists. And, uh, and then she said, oh, yeah, but it's, it's, she was right. So for some people, I mean, many people need an evidence for that. I think um, it, was, it was not so that, uh, I, I think it's, it's probably natural that people like to have an evidence, but you don't always get it. <laughs> don't expect it because then you don't get it. <laughs> you just get it when you don't expect it. <laughs> That's from one of the truth. Um, but we have another photograph, probably can show that with the Vestal and Asket, what we, you, um, uh, where we can see that. This is also one of the drawings of one of the notebooks from 1907. And there you can see Asket and Vestal, she's, um, she's say, uh, yeah, she's talking about. And this is, and she's always talking about this dualism in her, in most of her work is about this divided world that we have this male and female, right? And the Vestal and the Asket is a symbol that obviously comes out very often. And I think at one point she also said that she is the Asket and her friend Anna is the Vestal. I mean, someone who gives and the other one who, who got, gets it, but um, I think that varies in the group sometimes. So, um, but obviously she's really trying to, to be the one who gets the information. So she's really waiting for that. But while she is trying to connect, she is doing this, this work and work. And this is also her handwriting here. So most of the books are in her handwriting. She also um, uh, went over them later in her life. Um, but this is also a very nice uh, little drawing where you can see how many, <laughs> how many uh, uh, thoughts she had around uh, uh, the things and how she was trying to get it into, already into art, right? So, so trying to connect and, and yeah, and doing that. And it's somehow when you look at this, it's also, yeah, it's a whole universe, I would say, a whole universe you're, you're, you can look at. Why, why do you think that she kept her work from being displayed for so many years? What, what's kind of your perspective on that? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's so interesting. Um, well, in, um, in Buddhism, or maybe, I don't know how you call that in English, the Taoism, the Ta Taoism or something that, that they say you need 
not only the right person in the right place, but also at the right time. Um, obviously, it was not the right time. I personally don't like what the art historians has made of this story and uh, the museums, because I know um, many people said, oh, those are paintings for the future. I don't think so. They have never been paintings for the future because there is no future. They always have painting for now, paintings for now. And I don't believe that people are nowadays more open for Helmut of Klint's paintings than they have been around 1900 because there were people who, and we think many people, I would say many people have seen Hilma Afton's paintings because she had, they were hanging in a studio she built and uh, in the middle of the woods, almost let's say 45 minutes from Stockholm, west from Stockholm, there's the Mälaren um, Lake. And on one of the islands, she built a studio on, on some of the grounds of a friend. And it calls the Atelier House, which was unfortunately torn down. I hope it will be um, built up again one day uh, because um, then we could see how it was. So in the middle of the woods, she had this Atelier House and obviously she was, uh, the, the 10 largest were hanging there and met as many paintings she could hang up there. But the 10 largest, as we know, are <laughs> very, very tall. So you have three and a half meters high and two and a half meters length and 10, 10 times like that. And with colors so bright uh, coming out. And I imagine, and um, as far as we know, the, the windows were four and a half meters. So even if she had curtains, sometimes she must have opened them. And people will have walked probably from around the little villages around. I mean, they were walking in the woods looking for mushrooms or whatever, or going Sundays to church. And then they must have had a glimpse at those paintings, probably totally frightened because this is something they have never been seen at this time. I mean, imagine in 1918, seeing something like one of the 10 largest. It's not, we have seen that because we, we know Kandinsky, Mondrian, Malevich and all the people. Um, so um, I really think a lot of people must have seen, seen her work by then. Um, uh, so she was not, I don't think she was trying to hide it from everybody. I think people who, and she had a lot of friends or at least a, this group of the five. Oh, by the way, the group of the five, sometimes there were even many, obviously they invited sometimes people. So there were not only five, sometimes there were even more people or someone was not able and somebody else was coming. So those people have family and those people have friends. So you have not only a group of five, six, seven, ten, but even more people must have seen Hilma of Klein's paintings, even her family. And if you see something like that, whether you like it or not, that is not the question, but you wouldn't forget it. And, and you would talk about it. That's probably the first thing you do after you have set eyes of one of Hilma of Klein's paintings. You go home and tell your wife, you know, I have seen something. I, I, I don't know what that is. You have to have a look at it. I don't know, but that is possible that things like that happen. So obviously it was not so hidden probably as we think. It was not, I mean, since Helm Afton's lifetime, it was not at the attic, just after her. And that is probably your question because you said, okay, she was hiding it. The thing is she died in 1944. Nobody wanted her work. Okay, this is the big, big, tragedy of a genius in all times. Try someone to understand you. I mean, unfortunately, or I would say nowadays we can see, luckily, Rudolf Steiner did not understand. And obviously he thought this is more like a competition and he didn't want to have this competitive woman next to him with this incredible work. So they didn't like it. The Anthroposophical Society didn't like it either in Stockholm. And she obviously didn't know what, what to do with it. She had a friend, they were trying to find a place. So many people helped her, but she didn't succeed. And in the end, she said to her nephew, you know what? I mean, because she was very close to her nephew and probably, and she was becoming quite old. She was 82 when she was dying, when she died. So she told him, okay, please take care of it and probably just open it in 20 years after my death. This is not so uncommon, I think, 
especially at this time, many people said that, you know, don't open my letters, uh, read them again in 20 years or something. But that was very wise. I mean, probably something like that was the, the, the thoughts she might have had. It was 44, the, the war was still going on. And she thought, okay, what will happen? If I just leave it somewhere, somebody will throw it away. So it was not, not a bad decision, I would say. And imagine, uh, it was not her fault that when the nephew opened it in, in the 60s, 60s, I always had the feeling those are hippie paintings, <laughs> the 10 largest. So if they open that and the museum in Stockholm says, oh no, we're not interested, I mean, yeah, nothing more to say. I mean, this is beyond description, you know? Um, yeah, whatever they thought, um, all the prejudice they had, um, but obviously it didn't work. So it took another 20 years. So I think 42 years after her death was this exhibition in Los Angeles. And, um, but obviously, I don't know, we will see, but I think the right timing was now. So it's very interesting that we are going into a new, yeah, obviously into, into a new time period. And I don't know how this will work out, but I'm very happy that Hilma of Klin's painting are with us. Because at some point she said, this is important for humankind. And she didn't, uh, this is also something very theosophical that I um, discovered very early in Hilma of Klin's uh, paintings is this without ego. Why is it, is it working so well? Because there's no ego. Hilma of Klin was not looking to, for a career. She was not looking to be the first abstract artist. She was not even interested in that. No. And this is something, wow, what an achievement if you can do that. If you really try that in your own life, you will always uh, discover how, how often you fail. I mean, I, I discover that with myself and I say, okay, without ego, ooh, that's really, it's sometimes really hard because um, we, we keep on going and going and deciding and then you think, oh, is it important? Yeah, because I want it. And I want that and I have to, but this wanting and want to do something and I want success is just something that we have been told that it's important. In the end, that doesn't make us happy. But I truly think uh, Hilma of Klint must have been very content somehow in her life in the end, because she, she knew that this was something really, truly important for humankind. And I think this is something that is really working out right now because Hilma of Klin, I mean, her work is out there now and I have the feeling it's the right time. So it's all about the right timing. And it's not so much about that she was trying to hide it, but she was trying to find the right time. <laughs> yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I, you know, what, what that brings up for me is um, once again, this whole idea that she was a spiritual seeker. Mm -hmm. And that if her goal was to create for humankind mm -hmm. and something that was important for humankind throughout time, um, without regard to herself, to her career, to making money, um, which she certainly could have done because her other artwork was more than saleable. Um, and again, that she gave her life for spirituality, mm -hmm. for humanity mm -hmm. as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I, might, I might add, it's, uh, yeah, she, 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 she dedicated her whole life, but I think it was something quite natural to her. What is also very interesting is that she had healing powers in her hands. And at some point she's asking, um, she's writing in one of the letters to Rudolf Stein about it, but I think she never sent it away because she's asking, okay, should I use it to help people if I would like to help them? And, um, but obviously she did, because this is something that you also can find in Orca Fund's uh, uh, book, one of the first books about Hilma Flynn from the eighties, um, where obviously a neighbor is uh, telling the anecdote that she healed someone from the Spanish flu. Um, and um, so obviously she knew about the, her abilities, the abilities she had, and she was using them in the right way probably, but um, yeah, and, and, and trying really to live up to those, yeah, to the ideal <laughs> life. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
Um, what, when you, again, I, I, you've really said it in lots of ways, but the message mm -hmm. that she was trying to convey, the spiritual yeah. message, uh, you know, I've never seen her paintings in, in real life, only on yeah. through the internet um, yeah. and through this, this print, but mm -hmm. I, I, I can feel them mm -hmm. even from that distancing. So I can't imagine what it must be like to stand in front of them. Hopefully I'll get the chance one day, but yeah. clearly there is a message and a feeling and an energy that comes through. Yeah. Can you, yeah, yeah, it, it definitely comes through. And I think also um, it works even from a print because it's the idea behind it. And that is also very interesting that Hilma Flynn's work is now becoming famous where we have an infinite number of reprints. We can reprint it. Everybody has it on the phone. You make a photograph. You know, I have done a lot of filming and photographs of the paintings all over again. And there are, nobody has the rights anymore. This is, I think, very importantly to, to state that, to, just to say, you know, it's 70 years after her death. So nobody can say, I mean, there's a foundation taken care of, which is good that somebody takes care of the paintings, but it, they don't belong to anybody. And I think this is the most important message. They shouldn't belong to anybody because even Hilma of Klimt didn't think they belonged to her. That's why they are not signed. She never signed them like Hilma of Klimt did that. And she, this is a gift to humankind. And I think really, there couldn't be a better timing than now to do this. The message is theoretically probably not so easy. And probably we have another look at one of the images that I have um, from her notebooks. So I have another image from the notebooks. Here, this is um, starting with an A. This is one of the, Hilma Afton did a dictionary actually of her. Um, in the film, I'm, I'm, I'm showing it also very briefly, but very short. Um, so here you can see it starts with an A. So she goes through the whole alphabet. And, um, but what you can see is that it's not just one word. I mean, she's not um, giving one word to Amaliel or Altar or whatever. And you have a lot of symbols and a lot of writing. And it's getting, so in a way it's contradiction. So if you're trying to read and to understand it with, um, with your, um, yeah, just to understand it intellectually, um, I think at one point you won't succeed because that's not how it is working. But still, she's trying to do that and writing it down. And if you just read it like it is written, you don't have to think that it should make sense in the way we think it should make sense. Probably it makes sense in another way. And, um, and there's another, the second photo, there's another photograph of um, this book. Yeah, here, this is the W. And she talks a lot about the W and the U. This comes very often, U, W. And, and, and she says, this is something holy. But uh, here you can see WWW and a lot of, lot of ex explanations. So um, obviously she is trying to find something or she says it means this and that. And I think the best explanation we can give is this spiritual realm is not working as we think. It, it's not working as it works here on this planet. It's not that we say, this is hot, this is cold, and that's how it is. It is not. And funny enough, we people know that your thinking can change a lot, the way how you look at things. And so you can see here on two page, just on two pages that WU has many, many meanings. And uh, you're, you're trying to find out the one meaning, if you're trying to find out this, you won't succeed. You just have to let it be, you know, that's how, and, and that's why it makes it so hard probably to talk about the message, the meaning, because you don't get the message, you know, you have to stand up at six o'clock and then you do this and that, and in the end you will be a good human being. How fabulous would that be? <laughs> that's not how it is working. <laughs> so basically that's uh, just the two images. Um, yeah, the, the two excerpts from the notebooks. And that makes so much sense because the spiritual world, higher consciousness, those other realms of existence, 
Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. We cannot explain them. As we said in the very beginning, we cannot explain them in words and we've got to go beyond, yeah. beyond the words. Beyond the words. Yeah, and I think even probably going away now from these uh, notebooks and uh, uh, this writing is going to the message is looking at her paintings. Because as you said, you feel what's coming out of it. And I have the feeling really all the people feel it. You can stand there. Because for me, it was um, something that occurred to me in the very first few moments when I was standing in the exhibition for the first time. I looked around me and I thought, that is strange. An atmosphere like that in a museum? And I thought, what is it? And then I, th I think uh, the reason why the atmosphere was, or why I was thinking what a strange atmosphere is, there was, was a total lack of aggressivity. There was no aggress no, no, nothing aggressive and nothing aggressive in the paintings. And I don't mean aggressive that you see something aggressive, but even in a Mondrian painting, I would say is something human aggressive, not that's attacking us, but it's, it's something there. And in Hilma of Klint's painting, there's a lack of that. And that's, that is probably the reason why they're working so very well, because they are, they are made in a state where everything is absolutely gorgeous and where she's trying to come near to the idea of what our life is about. And in, in, in front of her paintings, we can connect better, better, even with our lives and even with ourselves. I have the feeling really, if you, if you really look closely, we can look at what life is, but also you can find yourself in it. This is really important. I think this is really an important message. It, it doesn't, it's not important how intellectual you can explain that. But if we can connect to ourselves and to the idea that is behind our being, then that's an achievement. I would say this, this is an achievement. Even just for a moment, that is an achievement. And that's why this is in such an outstanding oeuvre. Outstanding, I would say, really. And so essential in today's world. Mm -hmm. So essential. I mean, yeah, it was always essential. <laughs> But, but uh, at, at the moment, it's, it's very essential because uh, the whole digital world, which, is, which has in one way a big chance and in the other way is taking us far away from us because people are constantly distracted, constantly, constantly distracted by something. You can look at your handy or your computer, but this is not life. It's not, I mean, we can, we can live easily without our emails, without our, uh, uh, um, um, I'm saying handy mobile, I mean the mobile <laughs> yeah. phone. So um, yeah, so this is something we can live on very easily. So at, at, at some point we wouldn't miss it. But I think what is important, most of the people miss themselves in their life. That's why we have so many unhappy people and so many unhappy lives. And everybody knows for oneself. I mean, it's really hard to, to, to stick to yourself all the time. Um, and a work like that can help, could help. And it depends yes. how many people see that. But as we said, not everybody saw that even in her lifetime. She really had troubles to find someone uh, on her eye level. As we come near to the end of our time together, or at least for this part of, of the conversation, for our interview conversation, um, before we open it up for questions and answers, is there anything else that you wanted to say about Hilma or her work? So probably we can just, just to, to, to show again her message. So this is one, this is almost, um, this is the, not the last, but the second last painting of the Swan series where she is abstract. The last one is not really abstract. The swans are coming in again. She's closing the circle. But here you can so also see the idea of this universal idea that is coming, the lights, uh, the forms that are, that, that are combined here. And this is coming over and over and over again. The next painting uh, is from the series, the dove. And here again, 
we come from you have in the in, <laughs> in your background was the the dot number one so here you can see again there's the universe coming up so in her series she's really coming to to always showing us a whole and a detail and what i like here very much because like meeting yourself in in there in this in the in the dot in the middle of this painting there are two um, yeah obviously two angels you can see there if you go very close and you can look that up and even in the next one so the dove it's number i think 12 and 13 this is not another one so here we're coming really close to the, always to the wholeness of the whole thing and that, that is something that comes always in, in her series. You always have the feeling um, she's showing us details, but in the end, we're coming to the whole thing. And that is what Helena Blavatsky is talking about all the time, right? That we're, um, I mean, in her secret doctrine, that we need to try to be, we are part of this wholeness and we, we need to try to be there. And, um, and probably um, I have also selected one last painting, which I um, is an aquarelle in her later years. And this is, um, yeah, this is the chain. Um, this is, um, I call it the golden chain, but it's an aquarelle without, um, without a title. And it's from somewhere in the thirties, she, she painted this. This is one of my favorite. Because I have the feeling here she's showing us, you know, even in this dark universe we're in, there is something that is, you know, there's light and there's a chain that holds it all together, you know, or probably something like, yeah, a light, uh, like a golden chain <laughs> coming somewhere. But it seems to be uh, like wisdom and something, everything is good in the end. And I like this one especially very, very much. The golden chain that connects us all. Yeah. And that humanity is one. Right. That, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think for this, just to sum it up, for this work, I think we shouldn't put it in an ordinary museum. And Hilma Afplund herself, as I'm also talking in the film, talks about a temple idea. And therefore she made sketches. And here you see, this is also one of her notebooks where she made some sketches, obviously, for a temple. Just she's trying to find something which is also like a, like a spiral. And she's talking about a white temple that is made out of alabaster. And she's really trying to put there, or the idea is to put there the temple, temple paintings. And the temple paintings are the 193 paintings she has done from 1906 to uh, 1915 so her major work and I think I really love the idea that we would have at some day something like that and on the next page she's really trying to um, make it open it's not very well how you can see it but you can really see that you can can come to the um, uh, to this temple from every side so from north and west and uh, east and 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 south you can just go in there from every every side and the clue of the whole temple idea is now in the third um uh page we have here and here uh on the left you see a little tower and she's talking uh, in her writings that she thinks in this temple when you have seen all the paintings in the end you will go up a little tower in the middle of this temple and you walk up a spiral staircase and then you look into the universe in the end and i think this is a wonderful idea because then we are really in the connection between this work and the meaning of it <laughs> the universe <laughs> i mean we just can look up here <laughs> ahead of us <laughs> just or uh, above us we can just look above us but that that is something yeah i just want to mention that I, I really hope that this will come true someday. And actually, we are, uh, there's a little group now. We are trying to um, follow up the idea of Hilma of Klint and uh, find people who would probably support us um, where we could do a big crowdfunding probably around the world. A crowdfunding to build a temple with paintings that are meant to be for all the humankind, I mean, for all human beings. 
And what I like about the idea of a crowdfunding is probably that we would have in the end um, a temple that again, doesn't belong to anybody. So nobody could say with an ego, oh, it's mine, I have done it. <laughs> yes. So that, that would be something fabulous, yeah.